very good evening uh, valued clients of ig group uh, my name is manish chiradi and i joined the group uh, in uh, september as a strategist before ig i was with standard chartered bank and prior to that i was with dbs bank for seven years so um, uh, before we start standard disclaimer um, the uh, following slides and this part of the presentation is purely for education purposes uh, and these are purely my views um, uh, the audience is uh, advised to use discretion when it comes to assessing a risk reward or any investment decision okay with that um, i'm going to share uh, basically six stories with you um, when i say stories it's largely we're going to identify what are the key drivers of some of these currencies and also um, the fundamental drivers and also we we'll look at where is the uh, what are technical saying or what is the price action saying which way is the sentiment moving how is positioning moving so that we can assess uh, or at least get a sense of the trend let's set the backdrop uh, as we begin and uh, as the uh, uh, sorry So I'm just trying to get my screen. Ah, sorry. So as we um, last year, as we, as as the right uh, as the left panel shows, last year was clearly um, a negative year across all asset classes. Actually, you know, um, in history, uh, whenever there has been a negative year of equities and of bonds, then subsequently, at least, uh, there has been a single year in, in the last uh, few decades. That we've seen equities and bonds underperform back to back in two two years in a row so last year we had a significant underperformance of equities and other asset classes also but as you see on the right hand panel uh, this year at least has things have started on a good note now one of the main reasons why we saw that kind of a drawdown last year was because of the pace and the extent of us uh, interest rate increases it was it's actually the fastest on you know in the last few decades so clearly the uncertainty with regards to where are rates going to uh, going to top that process unsettled markets and which is why we saw uh, volatility also rise last year but uh, come october onwards uh, we we started to see a bit of a rebound so the rebound has continued this year but it actually started in october and a, pre, and a prime reason for that is that there were signs emerging that US inflation is indeed peaking. And if it's peaking, then it will be less incentive for the Fed to hike as aggressively as they did last year. So the backdrop really was a very uh, a high volatility driven backdrop as uh, uh, the left hand panel shows, whether it was equity market volatility, whether it was bond market volatility or even currency market volatility, a huge spike last year. But since late uh, 2022, we started to see a pullback as markets digested that we are probably nearing the peak in interest rates. Again, on the right hand panel, as June also shared earlier, that equity market sentiment was clearly very bearish. And some of those levels we've not seen since the great financial crisis. So clearly, sentiment was very stretched. And the market was clearly looking for a catalyst and that catalyst came in the form of uh, inflation so as as the left hand panel shows the red line is is uh, u.s headline inflation and u.s headline inflation clearly at least at least for now there are signs that it is indeed peaking or has peaked but as you see the other lines or the other economies we've not seen that kind of a dramatic pullback in inflation it's still hovering around those highs so this differential or the the widening of differentials where other countries other currencies are still uh, inflation is running high which means central banks may not be inclined to pause hiking interest rates anytime soon whereas the market is already beginning to uh, uh, figure out where and at what point in time the fed will pause uh, its hiking so that itself has been a key driver for US dollar, which is why we've seen a, a pullback uh, in, uh, 
in recent months as the right hand panel shows dxy positioning and the dxy which is the us dollar index has pulled back significantly since late last year and uh, again the reason for that is you know explained on the left hand panel where bond market volatility which is the the red line because of uncertainty with regards to how much interest rates or how much us interest rates will rise volatility in bond markets rose but as the market came closer to that peak in inflation uh, conviction that's when volatility in bond markets started to ease and one and that was very closely con connected with the, the the expectation that fed is now very close to its peak in interest rates even though it may not be the absolute peak but at least they are very close so the market at least tried to figure out that this is an area where the fed will probably pause notwithstanding the recent repricing higher in in the in the, in the last uh, uh, four weeks or so in february as a result of very strong us data but outside of that clearly the the talk still remains as to when is the fed going to pause uh, its interest rate uh, cycle uh, moving to asian currencies clearly as as volatility across financial markets eased as financial conditions ease we saw as the right hand panel shows that uh, asian uh, currencies rose a very sharp rebound that we've seen in the, in the last few months so broadly in, in addition to uh, um, uh, major currencies we also saw asian currencies rising and positioning has clearly moved towards uh, less us dollar positioning um, euro clearly as the left hand panel shows clearly market remains very long on us dollar it's still short on other currencies but less so compared to uh, compared to where they were last year even as we this is also coinciding with what we what we saw earlier that us dollar positioning still remains long but significantly less from what we saw now the big question remains that okay we've seen a bit of a pullback in us dollar and other some of the other currencies have risen uh, at least since uh, in, in recent months again notwithstanding what's happened in the last three or four weeks but broadly the trend has been of us dollar pullback the question remains okay how far are we going to see other currencies appreciate and the right hand panel is is the fundamental valuation and as we see most of the currencies are still undervalued even after the, the rebound that we've seen in recent months so there is still scope from a fundamental perspective at least for currencies to appreciate now again these are very long-term indicators so it may not happen in the next few weeks or next probably even next few months but broadly the trajectory still remains that there is scope for some of these currencies to appreciate against the us dollar lastly since we are on us dollar let's just look at what are the charts seeing as far as us dollar is concerned and as we see uh, interestingly us dollar was at a very nice support the trend line support which was um uh from uh, uh, uh from 2020 onwards and also the moving 89 day moving average but as we see momentum which is on the bottom panel the moving average convergent divergence which also seems to be a momentum indicator momentum still seems to be on the downside so even though we've seen a bit of a rebound that rebound could soon run out of steam or at least could face significant resistance as the daily chart shows so notice 200 day moving average and also you know a couple of other uh, price pivots along the way which suggests that the bar is rather high for us dollar to sustain this rebound that we've seen in the last uh, 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 few weeks so broadly the backdrop still remains at least the fundamental backdrop still remains that uh, ie where us dollar in, in just like us inflation may have peaked there is a very high chance that also us dollar globally may have peaked and any rebound could probably be a very short lived rebound so that's basically what the basic uh, the global usd backdrop was now let's look at some of the individual currencies and we we'll try to identify what are the what are the key drivers that have uh, moved these currencies recently and also again what are some of the levels to look at uh, which are uh, uh, you know on the uh, support on the downside and also on the upside so clearly when we look at euro um, um, you know china reopening really has uh, benefited europe because china really is, is the third largest export market for europe 
including machinery, vehicles, etc. So reopening in China tends to benefit European exporters and hence tends to support the European growth outlook. So that's one of the key drivers uh, for Europe. The second, as the right hand panel shows, that surprisingly winter in um, in Europe or not uh, in the uh, Northwest Europe has been much milder or at least warmer than usual. So the purple uh, shaded area is what the uh, last 30 year average temperatures are have been in Europe, which is in centigrade. And um, uh, the, the dark shaded area is what the temperature has been uh, since the beginning of this year. So as you see that since the beginning of this year, um, not uh, uh, Northwest Europe temperature have been significantly higher than the other averages, than the you know, long term averages, which has meant that the demand for natural gas has uh, reduced significantly. Now, as we know, the natural gas prices shot up significantly uh, a few months ago, but now we've seen since the middle of last year, we've started to see at least some sort of a, a, a significant pullback in those uh, prices, but largely. Europe has been dependent on natural gas, but now in recent um, uh, months, we've also started to see Europe uh, moving away from natural gas to alternative sources of energy. And one of them is clearly wind energy, uh, which clearly at least suggests that uh, the European economy could be far more resilient in the face of how China is moving. And today's data, as June pointed out earlier, a significantly uh, better than expected manufacturing number uh, much higher than what we've seen in recent years. So that clearly is a sign that China clearly is, the outlook on Chinese economy is clearly improving after the uh, reopening. This comes as the rest of the world, at least because of inflationary backdrop, is either slowing or there are recession talks, or as Jun mentioned, even the no landing talks are there. So at least one engine, which is the China engine, which is boosting, which has helped Europe so far. Um, as far as rates are concerned, uh, on the left-hand panel is where uh, U.S. rates are. Again, this is taken a uh, this is a bit dated. Uh, most recently, we have seen a change in U.S. interest rate expectation. But even then, even dated, as we see, the blue line is the number of the extent of rate hikes that the market expects in U.S. Even a few weeks ago, it was slightly less than three. Now it's slightly over three, so it's still around that three. But if you look at the right hand panel, the market is looking at at least five interest rate hikes by the ECB. So the fact that ECB will be later in the game to pause interest rates, that differential clearly has supported um, uh, Euro. And again, you know, from a very basic, you know, fundamental or macro perspective, for currencies, key drivers are not only the absolute levels of growth or absolute levels of interest rates but also the relative levels or how the rate of change of growth affects currencies. So whether it's rate of change of growth of inflation, rate of change of growth of economic growth itself, that tends to move currencies. And this particular chart shows us that the relative differential of uh, interest rates is moving, is moving in favor of Europe, which is why we've seen uh, Europe rebound. So Euro, as we see this chart shows, this is a slightly longer term time frame chart, which is a weekly chart, as you see a significant leap, but again, run out of steam at that 89 uh, week moving average and also happens to be that previous uh, pivot low. So overall, a very sharp rebound, but most recently we've seen a pullback. Now the, then the question comes, okay, to what extent this pullback could extend? So well, again, this is a bit dated. Now we are come close to that, um, uh, very close to the uh, previous pivot of 108, 40-ish. Uh, um, we've seen a rebound from there. But it seems as though that that previous pivot of 108, 40-ish uh, should hold uh, if this rebound is for real. Only a break below that uh, previous uh, pivot, which is the red dotted line, only a break below that would mean that the entire higher top, higher bottom sequence, which is an uptrend, would get disrupted and probably will end in some sort of a range. But at least until then, the path of least resistance for Euro still remains sideways to up. And it still looks like a pullback in the bigger scheme of things. So that was as far as the European story was concerned. What about Japan? Now, Japan is a very interesting story 
because Japan has the left hand panel shows, we've not seen inflation for, you know, at least sustained inflation for a long, long time. And finally, we are starting to see inflation back. And as you see, Bank of it's way above where Bank of Japan target is. On the right hand panel, Japan, Japan, Japan uh, uh, cash earnings or wages are highest in 25, 26 years. So that clearly is something that has changed in Japan, which is not the normal or not the BAU stuff. Now, it comes at a time when the Bank of Japan has promised to buy, or the e, -con e curve control policy, where they promise to buy the uh, you know, promise to keep a cap on yields, especially at, at 0.5%. 0, 0 now, at a time when globally yields are rising, Japan yields just at 0.5% clearly defies, uh, you know, to what extent BOJ will be able to support uh, or continue supporting this. And some in the market are calling this policy to be unsustainable. Why is it unsustainable? Because if BOJ keeps doing this for a long period of time, what will eventually happen is that BOJ will ultimately own all the bonds, technically again, just BOJ could own all the bonds in that particular bucket. If they own all the bonds, then there are two or three things that could happen. One, it could disrupt A, that part of the curve because government bonds or the government bond yield curve can also be, is also used as a benchmark for corporate pricing and many other pricings in, in the financial markets. So that's one. The second is that it could also potentially disrupt global financial markets. You know, JGB is one of the biggest markets. Pension funds also were the biggest holders of uh, JGB. So what happens to, you know, their books and once, you know, some of these uh, uh, dislocations start to uh, be, become more evident. So all of that has led to at least some of market participants saying that, okay, this will be unsustainable. And probably we could be seeing a shift in at least in BOJ policy, at least as far as the yield curve control is concerned. And, and maybe not uh, in terms of uh, interest rate hike. Even then, as the right-hand panel shows, the market still is looking at, finally looking at interest rate hikes in, in Japan. As a result of all of this, what's happened is that fund managers, at least in January, have are expecting uh, yen to appreciate. In fact, the yen appreciation expectations of fund managers, there was a, a survey, the yen appreciation expectations of fund managers is the highest in more than 10 years. That was, you know, uh, when BOJ last hike. So clearly, as the, the tide, at least, so to say, uh, is moving in favor of the yen, i.e. lower dollar yen. And this significant pullback that we saw, again, stalled at that 89 uh, period moving average. So 89 big moving average we saw in the DXY index, we also saw in euro, and we're also seeing in, in, in dollar yen, at least has supported the market to some extent. But as we see, again, this is a weekly chart, as we see, that momentum still continues to be on the downside. But likewise, the question then comes, okay, to what extent we've seen a rebound, to what extent it can rise? And again, 200-day moving average as this chart shows, and that previous high around that 137, 138, those would be very tough to break. I sent out an article yesterday uh, discussing about this, that the dollar yen has a very high bar to cross if it comes uh, closer to that A138 levels, i.e. it will be tough for it to break. Again, no certainties, but at least, um, there is a lot of resistance at least that could temporarily cap the upside. And again, as and the market will also need, as June mentioned, the market will also need more clarity uh, in terms of which way uh, what Fed officials think and, and Fed Chair Powell is speaking next week. So we'll have some more guidance at least as far as what the central bank thinking is uh, from the chairman itself. So far, at least Fed speakers have been hawkish, but they've not suggested the jumbo rate highs that we saw last year. So a very interesting time uh, um, as we go into the peak data period, which is manufacturing surveys um, starting today and also non-farm payroll data coming up. So that was as far as the yen story that clearly drivers are still in favor of yen appreciation, i.e. dollar yen uh, weakness going forward. Even as the first chart shows, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the earlier chart, in terms of valuation, even after this pullback in dollar yen, in terms of valuation of PPP measures, purchasing power parity measures, yen is significantly still undervalued even after this fall that we've seen in dollar yen. So still some scope, at least from a fundamental perspective for dollar yen to, to depreciate or yen to appreciate. Okay, 
that gets us to the next story, which is uh, UK or, or the pound. And the left-hand panel is clearly the story uh, in general that as we see consensus expectations for 2023 for UK, which is the, the dark blue line, consensus looking at negative growth for this year. So clearly, as we saw earlier, that foreign exchange markets work on relative growth differentials. So if one country is seeing a recession and the other country at least is seeing some sort of growth, that differential itself is enough to suggest that the country which has, which is, which where people expect a recession clearly could be an underperformer versus other countries which could be um, outperformers. Even as far as manufacturing surveys are concerned, as the right hand panel shows, UK manufacturing clearly has been far subdued. Consumer retail sales also uh, fairly subdued, and housing market clearly has become quite unaffordable, at least on some estimates. Um, but so far, again, talking from an inflation perspective, while growth to differential, as we saw in the earlier slide, as is working against the pound, but as we see in terms of inflation differential, US is probably an underperformer over here. That leaves us basically net net, you know, on a very balanced trajectory as far as uh, GBP is concerned. So, which is explained um, in the recent price action that we've not really seen a significant move in, in uh, since the start of this year. In fact, since the start of this year, GBP has just gone sideways. Uh, but clearly, uh, the, the the sharp rebound that we've seen since last year and that came across from very strong support, as you see, this is a long term chart which suggests that at least we may have seen the probability at least is uh, rather high that we may have seen the worst uh, for GBP. Why? Because as the chart shows two reasons. One is as we see the red trend line support, the market held that support. Second, the blue horizontal line, which is also the previous lows, the market was able to cross that. So those two signs are itself enough to suggest that at least some of the long-term downward pressure has begun to ease. Whether it's the turn for good still remains a question, but at least the probability is rising that maybe we may have seen the worst for GDP. So as of now, still looks like a range, but overall going beyond the short term from a very multi-week or multi-month perspective, a slightly bigger perspective, it looks like the risk reward is at least suggesting that maybe the chances are growing that we may have seen the worst in GDP is declining. Moving on to Australia, and just like Europe, um, China reopening has clearly benefited Australia in two ways. One, that China reopening and also China's improvement in growth outlook means that globally risk capital tends to be supported. So if Australian dollar is any benchmark or at least uh, a guide to where risk is moving, i.e. being a risk sensitive currency, it tends to improvement of global growth outlook tends to at least uh, support Aussie dollar. Secondly, China is uh, Australia's biggest export market. And uh, iron ore, as the right hand panel shows, we've seen a jump in iron ore prices. Iron ore is Australia's biggest export item. So both these factors, which is China reopening plus now also, you know, most recently uh, trade relations with China also have begun to improve as the new administration has taken over. So that again is at the margin uh, is a positive sign for Australia uh, in general. So far, as far as interest rate expectations are concerned, fairly balanced. So it still looks like the key driver still for Australia is going to be the China story, i.e. China reopening story and also commodity prices, how they are moving. At least some of them at least have shown some signs of rebound. So if if indeed, if there is no land as, as Jun pointed out, and if indeed global growth outlook tends to be fairly resilient, then it's quite possible that Aussie could, could uh, see some positive spillover effects of that improved uh, growth outlook or no recession scenario or even a, a soft landing scenario. As far as, uh, Charts are concerned, again, starting from a slightly bigger perspective, long-term perspective, uh, a very significant rebound. And as you see, the most, I, I've drawn a V-shaped rebound. The reason why I've drawn a V-shaped is that when a market is able to recover the last selling point, so the, the start of the gray line, uh, the start of the V pattern is was the, is, was the last selling point. If the market is able to recover the entire last selling point, it is. It often is indicates capitulation. If it often indicates that bears are finally exhausted, 
and the path of least resistance for Ponzi-Gallo could be sideways or up. A very a sing, uh, a similar thing happened uh, just uh, uh, before that, as you see in the COVID sell-off, a V-shaped rebound. As soon as the market was able to recover the previous selling point, we saw marginal falls because it was significant resistance. As we are seeing now, marginal falls. But notice, as soon as we were able to break that, we've not seen, uh, in fact, we doubled that entire move of that V-shaped pattern. So even in this case, a very similar thing that we may have seen capitulation. And again, possible that we could see high levels going up uh, or high levels for Aussie dollar. From a near-term perspective, 200-day moving average seems to be a very good support for Aussie dollar. And only, even if, assume, even if 200-day moving average is, gets broken, that January low is still remains an important support. Only a break below that January low, which is the horizontal dotted trend line, only a break below that dotted trend line will mean that the higher top, higher bottom formation, i.e. the uptrend, has got disrupted and probably the, change, the trend is changing from up to sideways. And that gets us to the last part of the, the, the presentation, uh, uh, which is gold. And what are the key drivers in gold? And clearly, there are a couple of key drivers in gold. Uh, one is a very well-established fact that real interest rates. So when real interest rates tend to rise, gold, which is traditionally a non-interest bearing, non-coupon bearing, non-dividend paying asset. So it's non-yielding asset. So when up interest rates rise or when real interest rates rise, something which is not fetching anything, the opportunity cost of holding that becomes high. So gold is very inversely correlated with what happens in real yields. So most recently, at least, we've seen a bit of a pullback in real yields, which is also reflected in how uh, gold has rebounded in, uh, recently. The second type of gold is settled by buying. And last year, as this chart shows on the right, the highest in recent years, settled banks bought highest in recent years. And uh, one, of, one of the reasons why we've seen, and that trend has been prevalent since the last few years, although the extent may vary, but the one of the most important reasons why we've seen settled bank buying is because of diversification away from USD. So USD as a proportion of uh, global central bank reserves used to be over 62% uh, a few years ago. Now slowly it is coming back. It's hovering around the 58, 60%. So gradually the, the idea or the central banks are moving towards a scenario where gradually they are shifting out of US dollar, excessive concentration of US dollar, and finally, uh, you know, looking at other uh, uh, assets, uh, other currencies, including uh, gold as an asset class. Broadly, for in terms of uh, jewelry demand, not nothing much to take away. But although seasonally, as we as this chart on the right hand panel shows, seasonally there tends to be at least some spurts of buying, but not as sustained as the previous two drivers that we saw earlier. Which means that the fact that the market is now looking at at least we are closer to that top in interest rates in u.s interest rates coupled with the fact that uh, uh, central bank buying broadly still continues we've seen at least uh, that as a left hand panel shows some uh, positioning which has moved in favor of gold asset managers or money managers clearly now moving in favor of gold so that that clearly uh, is a reflection of where the market sees uh, the bigger drivers lastly in terms of where gold is headed. So we look at, you know, a slightly medium term and then we we'll zero it down to the, the shorter term time frame. And over a slightly medium term perspective, there is nothing much to take. A very broad range um, and we are right in the middle of the range. So purely from the risk per reward perspective, we are in the middle of the range, so not so much juicy, which means that we may have to boil down to smaller time frames to look for, you know, any potential direction or sense of direction. Now, interestingly, we've seen a quite a bit of a sharp pullback, but again, the 200 day moving average seems to be a very good support uh, for gold. And again, uh, this afternoon, I've sent out something on gold saying that uh, uh, following yesterday's sharp rebound that we saw, that what are the chances that we will see gold continuing to ra rally further? Or what, is the what are the chances that the rebound since yesterday will continue further? And what are the levels to watch or what are the signposts to watch? for gold uh, going forward. With that, I will uh, pause over here and uh, we'll probably open up for uh, Q&A.